Hey friends, good morning, good morning. Pastor Darren Wood here to thank you and welcome you to worship at First Baptist Church of Midland. We are delighted to have you with us today. Today we're taking up Jeremiah chapter 12 where God asks a question in response to Jeremiah's question. Jeremiah says, God, why don't you do something about these people? Why don't you enact your judgment? Why don't you straighten them out? God responds in chapter 12 with something that we need to hear. By all means, get your Bible, take your pen and paper out, and let's walk through this together. God bless you, we'll talk in a few minutes. Hey, good morning, First Family. Good morning. What a blessed way to start a very special Sunday morning. I'm in the Baptistry Waters with our friend Brigham Goodman. What a joy to be here with you, my friend. Yeah, he sees himself on the TV. <laughs> We're out here with his family. What a joy it is to start this Sunday morning. Brigham, I got some questions for you, buddy. You ready? Do you believe Jesus is your Lord and Savior? Yes. Do you believe Jesus died on the cross for your sins? Yes. Do you believe Jesus was raised back to life for you? And do you believe Jesus is coming back for you someday? Yes. So Brigham, because of your confession and faith in Christ as your Savior and your willingness to take this first step of obedience, I do now baptize you as my brother and my friend in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. All right, you ready? Amen. 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 Let's pray for this handsome young man. Thank you, Lord, for Brigham. Thank you for the example of obedience we've already seen. I pray your blessings on him. I pray you bless his family. And I pray you would bless us, Lord Jesus, as we seek to be obedient just like he's already shown us. We love you, Lord, and we thank you for the chance to worship you today. In Jesus' name, amen.
I'll give God glory this morning. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on His name. Make known His deeds among the people. Sing to Him. Sing praises to Him. Tell of His wondrous works. Come thou found. those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that He has done. every blessing. I'm going to let you be seated. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. I invite you to sing this with us. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful when streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessing you for our life. 
describe it, but I can't contain it, can't keep it to myself. There aren't enough colors to paint the whole picture. There aren't enough words to ever say what I found. Wonderful and beautiful and glorious and holy is merciful. Without joining the chorus, there aren't enough notes to make the harmony. It's the song of the angels, through all of the ages, it's all of the earth and heaven symphony. Wonderful and beautiful and glorious and holy, he is merciful and powerful. Who are we talking about? That's my king. That's my God, that's my shepherd, my protector, that's my king, that's my rock, that's my anchor, my defender.
coming here in May of 1974. So I'm still trying to figure out where things are. But I'm the activities minister and very blessed to still be here. Hi, I'm Joe Jones, Director of Maintenance. Hi, I'm Erin Downey, Director of Media. Good morning, church family. I'm James Irvin. I'm the Generations Pastor. I deal with senior adults and with adult discipleship. I'm John David Culbertson. I'm the student pastor, so I have 6th through 12th grades. Good morning. Jeff Wash, Pastor of Worship, and my grandpa name is El Jefe. So don't forget that one. Good morning, Shumi Udarile, Associate Music Minister. You know, this is a good word. <laughs> Friends, on behalf of our church, let me just say thank you for the work that you do, for the way you serve the Lord, for the faithfulness you've shown to this church, and for the way you continue to serve well. Let's pray a prayer of blessing over them, shall we? Thank you, Lord Jesus, for these, your faithful servants, You've called them, you've gifted them, and you have called them here. We ask, Father, your blessings over each of them. Give them eyes to see what you see. Give them the heart of the shepherd that you have. Help us, Father God, to be faithful to encourage them, to love them, and to honor them. We ask, God, your mercy over them. Bless their families. There are challenges for them, too. And I pray, God, you would strengthen them for the journey that you've given them. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for calling us to serve you here together. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, my brothers and sisters. We're better for you. <laughs> While they're returning to their seats, I will ask you to turn your attention to our chapel for you and our welcome center. Out there, you'll find a voter information packet. We may never do this again, but we're doing it this time. As we've talked about voter registration in the election, several of you, church family, have come to me and said, Darren, I don't even know where to start. I don't know what a biblical perspective, a biblical worldview looks like, so can you help me? I found this packet that is platform conversations, not personality conversations. God knows we know enough about personalities. If you are as sick of political ads as I am, say amen. Let me tell you, couldn't even watch the ball game. Every commercial break, we had to have one or the other. And one break, we had them both. Gracious, give me some rest. This conversation, the one that you'll find in this packet, is about the platforms. It gives you each platform and a biblical perspective on it. It is not intended to endorse one candidate or one platform over another. You will find no such endorsement in that. It is long, several pages, but it is an opportunity for you to engage in the topics that are pertinent for this moment in time. I encourage you, grab one of those, take it home and read through it in preparation for tomorrow begins early voting. The election itself is two weeks from Tuesday. Let us pause right now and pray for our nation, shall we? We bow before you today, Lord Jesus, as grateful citizens of a wonderful and blessed country. We look around us, Lord, and we see just how blessed we really are. We thank you, Lord, for the way that you have shepherded us through the years. And we thank you, Lord, that this election doesn't scare you in the least. You're already on the other side of it. So we join you, Lord, in the confidence and the peace that comes from knowing you, Lord Jesus, will be king no matter who is elected president. Nevertheless, as wise citizens of this land, we intend, Lord, to participate in the election process. We don't want to be like those millions that we saw listed in the recent survey Help us, Lord, to be wise enough to know you've given us a privilege, and that is to vote. May we be guided not just by our opinions, not just by our thinking, but most importantly by your word, your timeless, unchanging word. I pray, Father God, for your protection over our land. I pray for those who would seek to lead us, 
that they would be governed by your authority. And I pray, God, for peace. Peace, Lord, no matter what the outcome of the election is. We trust you with it today, Lord. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, as my friend Flo said so wisely, this passage we're reading today out of Jer Jeremiah chapter 12 is a passage of significance. To understand it, you have to go back a little bit, and we will in just a moment, but we've titled today, Runs With Horses. I liked this title because it reminded me of the movie Kevin Costner was in, Dances With Wolves. You remember that? It was kind of a strange story about a guy that was out of context. He was doing things his own way, and he joined a group of people who couldn't really understand him. He had to find his way in a strange and foreign land, even if he wasn't so far from his home. This is exactly the situation that Jeremiah finds himself in. He has been prophesying, by the time we get to this chapter, for 11 chapters, warning the people on bended knee, please, God doesn't want to bring his judgment to you. He doesn't want to rain his wrath upon you. He longs to welcome you back, but your behavior, your path, the direction that you're headed simply is not sustainable. Please, Jeremiah says, repent. The people reject him. They tell him over and over again, We've done nothing wrong. We see no error. We see no fault in our pathway, and we see no need for repentance. When we get to chapter 11, we find Jeremiah is in, on the wrong end of social circles. Polite company doesn't talk about him anymore. They are whispering, those who aren't polite, that they want something done about this renegade prophet that keeps running his mouth. You know, somebody really should do something about him. Who's in charge around here, somebody might have said. We think he is an enemy of the state. As such, we are going to take revenge upon him. Who is he to tell us that God is angry? Who's he to tell us that God is gonna bring judgment? Who does he think he is? Oh, friends, let's be clear. Rather than repent, they wanted to move the goalposts. Rather than repent, they wanted to silence the one calling them to it. God whispered a warning into Jeremiah's heart to protect him. You find it in Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 19. And this is where we start today. Now, I want to caution you. Most of the time when I'm preparing for Sunday morning, I'm looking for something that I can say that is happy, that is joy-filled, that will bring a word of light and hope into your life. Well, today isn't always one of those kind of talks. But my calling as your pastor and shepherd is not just to tell you what you want to hear, but what you need to as well. And by all means, when we get to this section, we confront a reality that is consistent throughout Scripture. Godly people should expect the same treatment Jesus received. Godly people should expect the same treatment Jeremiah received. In other words, you will not be well received. You will not be popular. If you stand on God's truth, don't expect people to applaud it. If you engage in God's word and you let it govern your life, there will be many who will come to you and say, you're speaking judgment to us. Who are you to tell me what's right and wrong? We can be confident, friends, in this. There will be many who will seek to undo you, just like they did Jeremiah, and later, just like they did Jesus. Don't let it surprise you. The call to Christ, the call to obedience, the call to holiness in this life is the, also the call to suffer. I don't know where we got the idea that if we are walking with Christ that there should be this parade given to us simply because we are. I don't know where we got this notion that God owes us ease of life when 
we don't find that in Scripture. Now, that doesn't mean we have to go looking and poking hornets' nests just for the fun of it, but it also means that we should realize that godly people should expect to suffer. Don't let it surprise you. It didn't surprise Jeremiah. I want you to see Jeremiah chapter 11, verse 20. I want you to see this, and I want you to see how Jeremiah prays. This prayer that he offers is a prayer for vengeance and a reasonable one at that. See it in verse 20. But, O Lord of hosts who judges righteously, who tests the heart and the mind, let me see your vengeance upon them. For to you have I committed my cause. He's praying, God, sick them. Have you ever prayed a prayer like that? Yeah, I think most all of us have, especially if we've been stuck behind somebody, right? Driving down the road and they're driving erratically. God, would you just get them? The only problem is sometimes somebody behind us is praying the same prayer. What we need is to be mindful that even if it's a reasonable prayer, even if it's a consistent one, God is calling us to deeper waters. Now, if you find yourself in a moment right now, just this moment, praying a similar prayer to the one you just heard from Jeremiah, understand he's not the first one to pray it. Go back to Psalm chapter 3, verse 7, and you'll find in the words of David, the words that say, Arise, O Lord, save me, O God, for strike all my enemies on their cheek. You break the teeth of the wicked. David's praying the same prayer. Get them, God. Can't you see what they're doing? Sick them. Do something about this. Well, I want to tell you, friends, God is doing something about it. I want you to hold on to this now. God is doing something about it. As your shepherd, he's calming you. And that's not exactly what we wanted. Wait a minute, God. I'm calm enough. What I want you to do is get them. If you get them, I'll calm down, I promise. It doesn't always work that way, friends. You see, when we find ourselves in that moment of suffering, the waters just got deep. Deep, much deeper than we can stand up in. Deep, the kind that gets stirred up when the storms come and the waves get high and they wash against us and we're wondering, where is God in the midst of this? Why doesn't God do something about this? Uh, he is. The shepherd is guarding our souls. Now, the desire for vengeance is innately human, but left unchecked, left, get this, untransformed by the Spirit of God, it will destroy us. Uh, consider that the people of Jeremiah's day fervently believed that God would never punish them that God would never, never in a million years withdraw his protective hand. God never would do that. They believed that God owed it to them to protect them and govern their days until they died. Well, I'm going to tell you, friends, God, he doesn't owe us anything. In his mercy, he has already given us everything. Because of Jesus... We are the recipient of everything. And yet, walking with Jesus means that in this world we may not have everything. Jeremiah is being led by God to trust him in a whole new way. Now, Jeremiah's prayer reflects that God isn't seeing things right. Have you ever tried to tell God you're seeing it wrong? God, Come around to my side of the table and look at it from where I am. You'll see how wrong you are, God, and then you'll know that I'm right and you should do something my way instead of your own. Now, some of us might snicker at that and we might say, well, Darren, a lot of us are more mature than that. Uh, yeah, right up until the waves get high. When the heat comes on, when the pressure cooker gets turned up, that's when we usually find ourselves wondering, where is God? 
And why doesn't he do something? Why doesn't he do something about these that seek to do me harm? The prayer for vengeance is an innately human one. But let me just pause the story of Jeremiah here because we're going to come back to this later. In fact, if you're reading our reading plan today, then chapters 35 and 36, where we are today, is the story of when Jeremiah is arrested. This section is much longer than we have time for, but I want us to pause the story of Jeremiah and jump over to the New Testament because here's the thing. We have something on Jeremiah that he didn't have. We have the peace and mercy of Christ himself given for us on the cross, the penalty of our sin already paid, the transforming, sanctifying grace of Jesus flowing all over us. And so the G- Jesus' transforming desire for us compels us to change. He wants us different. While vengeance is still something we might desire, the transforming grace of Jesus changes me. Jesus calls us to a transformed life. This transformation moves me in a new direction, a direction away from the path that I used to be on. It invites me to embrace Jesus' call to self-denial, to surrender, to forgiveness, and to forestall vengeance. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Put it off on him and let him do it. Hear the word of the Lord from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 39 to 41. I say to you, Jesus said, don't resist the one who is evil. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other one also. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic, let him have your coat as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two. The concept absolutely boggles the human mind but it frees the transformed one. It frees it. It is as if we have been walking on this side all of our lives, that transformation, that perspective that we had has put us to this side, and now Jesus has picked us up and transformed us and carried us over here and said, here's where I want you to be. Don't don't keep walking that way. Transformation means a different perspective. You know, I thought long and hard about how to talk about this perspective idea, and I found some, maybe pick up the pictures that might help with that. I want you to see a statue that is in our, our, our friend Chicago. Let's take a look at this first picture. Now, when you see this, these are Air Jordans, Air Jordan tennis shoes hung from the ceiling. And when you see it from this perspective, you're like, You know, that's really interesting art. It's hung from a second floor. It's hung into an atrium kind of area. And you see it and you're like, that's really curious. But when you step back away from it, then you get a very different perspective. Move to that second picture, would you? All of that is made up of exactly what I showed you just a moment ago. Go back to the first one. This is exactly the same as, go to the second one, that. It's all in how you see it. It's the perspective that you have. The closer you get, then it's easy to pick out each individual shoe. But you were never meant to see just the shoes. You were meant to see Michael Jordan. That was the whole idea of this piece of art. This, friends, is a reminder perspective is everything. Maybe you're like, okay, that's just one funky thing that Darren found because he's still hung over about the Air Jordans he had in the 80s. You're right. We'll talk about that another time. But I want you to see there's another piece of art that I found. Now, when you walk in to this particular room, this is what you see. A bunch of what appear to be rubber balls hanging from the ceiling. When you see them from this angle, you're like, somebody had way too much fishing line, way too many little balls, and way, way too much time on their hands. That's all this is, just a mess of balls hanging from the ceiling. When you move around in the room, though, go to that next picture, you begin to see, no, there's something there. Even now, though, it's hard to see. The perspective still isn't quite right. Take one more step, go to the next one, and you begin to see there's something really there. 
Take that last step and you'll see it as the artist meant for you to see it. This is looking straight on to that mess of balls hanging from the art. This is called anamorphic art. I learned that this week. You'll be glad to know uh, that I learned that. When you look at it straight on, this is what you see. But go back to that first one. Can you go back to that first one, Maggie? It's the same thing. It's all in how you see it. Perspective changes everything, doesn't it? So now let's move away from silly pictures of art and let's move back to our own lives, all right? Are you ready with me? How do you see the suffering that you're walking through right now? See, the mistake we make is we look at it from the wrong perspective because we want to see it up close and we want to keep it right here. God, see it like I see it. Well, God steps back far enough that he sees it differently. Not only that, according to Isaiah 55, he invites us to join him and see it like he sees it. My ways are higher than your ways, he says. Come up here and let me show it to you like I see it. That can only happen through transformation. When I allow my life to be sanctified, when I allow Jesus into my life, when I allow him to change me, when I'm not so ironclad grip on my problems and my solutions, then I can let my hands open and I can say, God, help me see it like you do. Let me give you a couple of things to take home. If God calls you to something hard like he did Jeremiah, God's strength is more than enough. God's calling will not take you where his provision isn't. God's calling will equip you where you are. And get this part, our transformation demands every inch of our being. One of the great mistakes that I made earlier in my Christian walk was believing that I could segment life, that I could compartmentalize, that I could say, hey, God, I'm willing to give you all of this here right here, but I want to keep this part. I want to keep this part and just keep it for myself because after all, every man deserves something, right? It wasn't until I was ready to say, God, just take all of it. I'm tired of holding on to it. I'm tired of the struggle. I'm tired of the pain that comes from not surrendering it all. So I'm just surrendering it all to you. Our transformation, if it's to be what God wants it to be, demands every inch of our being. So that leads us to that whole conversation. We're done with the introduction now. Are you, are you happy about that? Now we're ready for chapter 12. It's a conversation between Jeremiah and God. Jeremiah's problem with pain and God's answer. That's what you see in verses 12, chapter 12, 1 to 6. Let's just admit this. Pain is a timeless theological crisis. Why would God allow this why would God allow persecution for those who were seeking to honor him? Why not strike the enemies of God down like he did with Pharaoh in Exodus 14, Korah's rebellion in Numbers 15? Why would God allow this? For Jeremiah, this was purely personal. And yet, he was also worried about the people of God. People were suffering, but not just because of their own sin, because of the wickedness of their leaders. Even the land itself was bearing the burden of their evil. That didn't seem fair. And that's why, in chapter 12, verse 1, Jeremiah asks the core question, why do the faithless live at ease? Verses 2 to 4, Jeremiah offers a solution. Hey, I know how to solve the problem of pain, Jeremiah says. Drag these leaders away to slaughter and leave the rest of us. I want you to see God's answer in verses five and six because it changes Jeremiah's question. It changes Jeremiah's question. You see, Jeremiah poses a question, but consistently for the word of God, God answers it with a question that changes the original presupposition. He offers him three theological realities in these two verses, five and six. 
that causes us to say, this is a reality that we can cope with. If you have a run with men on foot and they have worn you out, how will you compete with horses? What does that mean? Well, my reading of it is this. Godly service isn't designed for ease. If you're intent on running with God, then that's like running with horses. And if you can't run with men, how will you ever compete with a horse? God tells Jeremiah, in essence, you're using the wrong metric. The algorithm that you have adopted here is insufficient. Jeremiah is measuring himself and his people by a ruler that only has centimeters. God says, I'm going to measure you in feet. Don't try, God says. Don't try. If I wanted to make it easy, I would make it easy. But I don't want to because if it was easy, you wouldn't need me at all. Our God says, trust me. Hard questions are always allowed, but trust me if there is no answer. God has called us to himself, not to ease. Embrace God's calling, and you'll find something better than ease, than the answer that you're looking for. You'll find purpose. How can you know that for sure, Darren, just based on what we have? Well, let's just talk about what we have because it's important to recognize this is chapter 12. There are 52 chapters in Jeremiah's prophecy. If Jeremiah wanted ease, he would have stepped out in chapter 12. We got 40 chapters to go. It's like watching a John Wayne movie and seeing him in trouble in the first 30 minutes of the movie. You know he ain't in trouble. There's a whole long movie yet ahead. They can't kill him off. Likewise with Jeremiah, you know he chooses God's purpose more than his own. Here's another element to it. God's service becomes easier with longevity. The word of the Lord seems to indicate here that faithfulness, kindness, and mercy from God when the chips are down invites me to a new level of appreciation for the God who stands above the fray. He isn't as worried because his sovereignty and wisdom are beyond reproach. I can rest, and longevity in that rest teaches me to relax when the jar gets shaken. Longevity in knowing God's faithfulness, his mercy, his kindness, his strength, causes me to say, okay, I know I can trust him. It's a little like one of my favorite authors, Malcolm Gladwell, the book that he wrote called The Tipping Point. In the book, The Tipping Point, he makes an argument, and it's a well-reasoned one. If you haven't read it, I encourage you to do so. It's not a, a godly book, but it is one that I think is worth your time. In that book, here's what you'll find. He says, 10,000 hours. It takes 10,000 hours to go from something that you do to something that you are. 10,000 hours. It moves from something that is a task to a part of you. If you want to see what that looks like in practice, then just watch our orchestra and our choir members. You see it. Long ago, they, most of them have passed that 10,000 hour barrier where it's no longer something that they do It's something that they are. For godly service, longevity becomes like that. God says, trust me, now, later, and later still. Why do so many people quit then? Because so many of us are governed by our emotions. We allow our emotions to tell us what feels good and what doesn't. And what feels good, we stay with, and what doesn't, we abandon. Now, while that's good sense in some respects, friends, let's rest confidently in this. 
our God is not interested in making it easy. He's interested in making us holy. Let's end with this part. Godly service seeks enough humility to remember he's not the main character. He, who that he is at the end, I should have written that differently. Jeremiah is not the main character. When God warns Jeremiah, if you couldn't run with men, what makes you think you'll run with horses? He wants Jeremiah to zero in on his limitations. It's not that Jeremiah doesn't want to run. It's that he was never meant to run that race in the first place. God is challenging our friend Jeremiah, a lot like a sapling being pushed by the wind. Now, we know something about wind here. This week even. And we also know that if you're going to plant a tree here, you're going to have to guard it. When you plant it, then you guard it best by not only watering it, by staking it so the wind can't push it. But you don't want to stake it too tight. <coughs> you want to give the tree enough flexibility to where it can move because you need its roots to go down deep. And if the, the, the full measure of resistance to the wind is tied up in those stakes, it will never develop the root system. So you'll always have to have those stakes. You want it to develop enough strength you want it to dig down far enough to where it can sustain itself. Where the wind, when it comes, and it's sure to come, when the wind comes, that tree need not be afraid. That is exactly what God is doing here with Jeremiah. For Jeremiah, he is not the main character in his own story. God is. Imagine with me, you go to the movies. You go to see Batman. You walk in, and Batman never appears in the movie that wears the name Batman. I don't know about you, but I'd be walking back to the movie theater office and asking for my money back. Hey, I paid to see Batman. I want to see him. Or imagine you go to see a movie about Iron Man, and when you walk into the movie, you realize that after you've watched the whole movie, Iron Man never appeared. Hey, what's the deal? This is supposed to be his story. Well, I want to tell you, friends, could it be that we have inverted the story who is the main character in your story? If it's you, you're thinking too small. Our God calls you to himself. What does that mean? Well, when you're the hero, you have to carry the story. When it's all about you, you have to keep going. And let me be clear, people will flatter you and they'll seek to influence you. But hear the word of the Lord here from straight from verse 6. Guard your heart. Don't believe them. It's not about you. This is about the God who seeks to transform you. And now we're at the end. What do we do about this? Well, here's the first thing that we do. Nothing. God doesn't need you to do anything. What he wants is more than that. He wants you to be. Be a verb of existence, a verb of function. He wants you to be his. Is that easy? Most of the time, but not always. Being God's means you're being transformed by him. It's much easier to do godly stuff, but God can raise up the rocks to do that. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. What he wants is you to be his. But that demands that you come all together and say, I am yours. Do with me what you will. This is your story. Friends, I want to invite you to the freedom that comes from being his. Here's what Jeremiah found, and I think it's what you will too. It's enough. Our lives are meant for a purpose, and that purpose is best expressed in the work of Jesus Christ in each of our lives. Perhaps, just maybe, you've never encountered Christ that way, in a personal sort of way. I got good news for you. You can do so today. We're going to stand up and we're going to sing in just a minute, and I'll be waiting right down here. 
Come talk to me and let me tell you how you can find Jesus in a personal way. Maybe you've done that, but you've made yourself the main character. Today's a good day to repent. Ask God for the freedom to turn around and go another direction. Maybe you've been trying to run with horses and God says, today's a good day to stop. Rest. Maybe you're in the midst of a moment of suffering and you're wondering where God is in, the, in your suffering. He invites you to a new perspective. Join him and find that he's enough. Let's pray together. I know, Lord, <clears throat> the struggle that comes from being uncertain. Uncertain about what's ahead. Uncertain about why you're doing things the way you're doing them. Uncertain about the meaning behind my own pain. Just like Jeremiah, Lord, there are times that I've prayed wrongly for you to get them. But today we pray, Lord, for transformation. For some of us for the very first time. Meet with us in this time, Lord Jesus. Show your power in changing each of us. And let today be the day that you do have your way in the being that you've given to us. We love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for having joined us today, friends. What a joy it's been to have you with us. On the screen now are some ways you can reach out to us. And by all means, we want you to feel free to do so. The topic we've talked about today is painful. It's one that is common to the human condition and one that we all struggle with. So if you're struggling with some of that right now, then by all means, use those things that are on the screen. Reach out to us and let us reach out and serve you. God bless you. Thanks for joining us today. May the mercy, peace, and grace of Christ go with you. See you soon.